Today is my time with Noah. I will continue the reading on the book of the, the Life of David through the Psalms by uh, Alexander McLaurin. We are in the eighth chapter. The title is The Tears of the Pertinent. 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 Am I right? Pertinent. I think he's talking about the, his uh, experience with Benish, uh, Baal Sheba. Can you believe that? Last night I just read a word talking about. David at Baal Sheba, can you believe that? So, this morning, actually. So, mm. I'm thinking about it. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. Psalm 51, basically. So, let's move on with the real test. So, the text, sorry, not the test. And the word city had taught David self restraint and embraced the soul and driven him to grasp firmly the hand of God. And prosperity had seemed for nearly twenty years, but to perfect the lessons, gratitude and followed deliverance and the sunshine after the rain, and brought out the fragrance of devotion and the blossoms of glad songs. A good man, and still more a man of David's age, and the date of his great crime seldom falls so slow, unless there has been previous pampers unconscious relaxation of the girdy loins, and negligence of the untrimmed lamp. The sensitive nature of the psalmist was indeed not unlikely to yield to the sudden force of such a temptation as it conquered him, but we can scarcely conceive of its having done so without a poor decay of his religious life, hidden most likely from himself, and the source of that decay may probably be found in self-indulgence, fostered by ease and by long years' command. The actual fall into sin seems to have been begun by a slothful abdication of his functions as captain of Israel. Its pampers not without a bitter emphasis to the narrative introduced it by telling us that at the time when kings go forth to battle, David contented himself with sending his troops against Ammon and tarried still and Jerusalem. In all events, the story brings to sharp contrast the levy in mass encamped around Rabbath and their natural head, who had once been so ready to take his share for blows and privations, loitering behind, taking his quiet siesta in the hot hours of afternoon, and if there had been no soldiers of his sweltering in the armor, and rising from his bed to stroll on his palace roof and peer into the household privacies below, as if his heart had no interest in the grim tussle going on behind the hills that he could almost see from his height. And they grew purple in the evening twilight, and had fallen to the level of an eastern despot, and has lost his sense of the responsibility of his office. Such loosening of the tension of the moral nature as is indicated in his absence from the field during want was evidently a very severe as well as a long struggle prepared the way for the dismal headlong plunge into sin. Now, the Sufundos here, we understand that this time he has three wives, am I? Abigail was one. Uh, the other one, I forgot the names. He has uh, three or four wives already, am I right? So, making sense to you? You know, so. The stories are told in all its hideousness without palliation, palliation or reserve, without comment or heightening, in that the stern judicial fashion, so characteristic of the Bible, records of its greatest characters, every step is narrated without a trace of a softening and without a word of emotion. Not a single ugly detail is spared. The portraiture is as vivid as ever. Beersheba's willing complicity, her punctilious observance for ceremonial propriety while she is uh, trembling under food, her hollest obligation. The fatal necessity which drags the sin of the sin that summons up the murder to hide, and if it be possible, the full form of idolatry, 
the stain rebuke in the conduct of uh, Uriah, who, whom he tied as he was, has more cavaliers, 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 am I right? Cavaliers. No, I'm sorry. It's chivalrous. Chivalrous, chivalrous. Okay, not to see the world shrinking yeah. from personal ease, while his comrades and the ark are in the field, than the king has. The mean treason, the degradation implied in getting to Joam's power, the cynical plainness of the murderous letter in which. A hardened conscience names its purposed evil by its true name. The contemptuous measure of his master, which Joam takes in his message, the king's indifference to the laws of his men, so long as Uriah is out of the way, the solemn platitudes with which he pretends to counsel his tool for the check of his troops, and the hideous haste with which. After her scrupulous mourning for one week, Beersheba threw herself again into David's arms. All these particulars, and every particular uh, aggravation, set out forever, as man's most hidden evil will one day do, in the clear, unpitying, unmistakable light of the divine record. What a story it is! This ascent of nearly fifty years of age. Bound to God by ties which his rapturously felt and acknowledged, whose words has been the very breath of devotion for every devout heart, forgets his longings after righteousness, flings away the joyous divine communion, darkens his soul, ends his prosperity, brings down upon his head for all his remaining years a cataract of calamities, and make his name his religion. A target for the barbed sarcasm, sarcasm, sarcasms of every succeeding generation of scoffers. All the fences and the whole array which God's mercy and His own past had reared, when cunning sin sweeps quite away, every obligation is office, as every grace is a character, is a trodden underfoot. By the wild beast rose in his breast, as a man, as a king, as a soldier, he is found wanting. Lust and treason, and craft and murder, are goodly companions for him who had said, "I will walk within my house with a perfect heart; I will set no wicked thing before my eyes." Why should we dwell on this wretched story? Because it teaches us, as no other page in the history of God's churches does. All the alchemy of a divine love can extract the sweet perfumes of a penitence and praise after the filth of a sin, and therefore, though we turn with loathing from David's sin, we have to bless God for the record of it and for the lessons of hope that come from David's pardon. To many a sin tortured soul since then, and the two sons. That is,、uh, can you give me the the number? That is fifty、um, one. Am I? First one. The first one is fifty one. Second one is thirty two. Oh, fifty one thirty two. Okay, fifty one thirty two. All blotted out with tears, in which he has sobbed out his penitence, have been as footsteps in the great and terrible wilderness. They are too familiar to need. And to secretly bear many words here, but we may briefly note some points connected with them, especially those which assisted us in forming some image of the summoned state of mind after his transgression. It may be observed that of these two psalms, the fifty-first is evidently earlier than the thirty-second. In the former, we see the fallen man struggling up out of the horrible pit. And Mary Clay in the lantern, he stands upon the rock, with a new song in his mouth. Even the blessedness of him whose sin is covered. It appears also that the boast must be dated up to the sharp thrust God's lassitude, which Nathan draw into his conscience, and the healing balms, balsam, 
Bosom. Yeah, that's a strange word. I don't check that. Okay. What it means? It means uh, aromatic, resinous substance such as a bomb is used by various trees, the shrubs that use as the base for certain fragrances and medical preparation, basically a, a medicine, right? The healing balsam of uh, balsam of uh, God's assurance of forgiveness, which Nathan laid upon his heart. The passionate cries of the son as echoed the divine promise, effort his faith to grant so the keep the merciful gift of pardon. The consciousness of, the for, of forgiveness is the basis of the, of the prayer for forgiveness. Let's repeat that. Interesting. The consciousness of forgiveness is the basis for the prayer of the prayer for forgiveness. What that means? The consciousness of forgiveness means aware of forgiveness. Is a basis for of the prayer for forgiveness. Okay, okay. Basically, you know you can be forgiven, am I? You know the benefit of forgiveness. Making sense to you? So you understand the power of forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. That's why you pray for forgiveness. Okay. Somewhere about a year passed between the crime and the message of Nathan. And what sort of a year it was? The psalm tells us. Tell us. The core satisfaction is a sin could no longer could not long content him. As he might have done a lower type of man. Nobody buys a little passing pleasure in evil and so dare a rate or keeps it for so short a time as a good man. He cannot make himself as others, that which comes into your mind shall not be at all in that ye say we will be as the families of nations which serve wood and stone. Old habits quickly reassert their force. Conscience soon lifts again its solemn voice. And while worse men are enjoying the strong flavored myths on sin's table, the servant God, by being seduced to prefer, prefer them for the moment to the light bread from heaven, tastes them already bitter in his mouth. He may be far from true repentance, but he will worse soon no remorse. Moses may pass before he can feel again the calm joys of God. But disgust with himself with his sin will quickly fill his soul. No more will be the picture for such a state has ever been drawn than is found in the Psalms of the Spirit. The tale of sullen silence, dust, hand settled down. The strings of his harp, as on Hamlet the sword, he will not speak to God of his sin, and there is nothing else that he can speak of. He tells of his roaring all the day long, the groan of anguish forced from his yen on softened spirit. The night God's heavy hand wind him down, the consciousness of that power whose gentleness and once holding him up. Crushed, but did not melt him. Hey, one forty-four now. Like some heated iron, it's a heaviness, scorch as well as bruise. It is moisture, all the dew and the freshness of his life, was dried up at his touch, and turned to dusty, cranking draught. Then it chaps the hard earth, and shrinks streamlets, and burn to brown powder. The tender herbage. Uh, are you still there? Yeah. <laughs> I'm still in recording. I'm not going to do anything about it. Okay, let's move on. Where are we? Where were we? Oh, Psalm 32, am I? So, okay. I'm going to read those two Psalms first and before we move on, okay? So, yeah, I like to, to read them before I know what they're talking about. Psalm 51. Oh, I just open up to it. Psalm 51 for the director of music. The Psalm of David. When the prophet Nathan came to him after David and committed adultery with the Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away 
all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was a sinful and birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with high soap, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Is that amazing? Hmm? Hallelujah. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Quit in me a pure heart, O God. I renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word actually is means a right spirit, uh, a good proper spirit, making sense to you. You know, so yeah, the word actually should translate right spirit. You know, a wrong spirit, right spirit. We say wrong heart, a wrong uh, heart, or versus a, a right heart. Am I right? So a pure heart. Yeah. Steadfast spirit and steadfast, uh, well, it's uh, descriptive, but it's it's right to God, am I pleasing to God, making sense to you? So accept to God. Yeah. Let's repeat that again. Creating me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me. See, there's a two spirit, him right? One is a human spirit, amen, or consciousness, amen, or conscience, whatever, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's an active thing, it's more than a descriptive thing, am right? It's his own being, amen, hallelujah. It's essence, his heart. Then the Holy Spirit, the one who counsels him, accompany him, teaches him, am I? Inspire him to praise God, worship God, and uh, to render justice and to walk in, in wisdom, joy. Am I making sense? Making the right decision. Making sense to you? So, yeah. So, right. yeah. he evidently cast that aside. Am I? Therefore, sin and uh, transgression overtake his life. Am I? There's, there must be a corruption of the heart, then the mind, then deeds. Am I making sense to you? Right now, he won't come back to that sweet uh, fellowship with God. Am I? That's that. Uh, one is with his Holy Spirit in terms counsel. Am I making sense to you? So yeah. Anyway, it's worth to, to ponder on these things. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a one a willing spirit, another one to sustain me. A willing spirit. Can you believe that? That means a yielded spirit. Am I a quick? To follow, amen. Hallelujah. Making sense, you know. James use the word called slow to speak. Basically, slow to move your, out your own counsel, your own mind, am I? Your own understanding, amen. Quick to listen, you know. Amen. Quick to listen, more than quick in terms of pace, in terms of time. But it was talking about uh, attitude, am I? This is the first thing you do, am I? Making sense to you? So this is the default. Amen. It says, puncture your heart. Then slow to anger. The word anger is not really good translation. It means to be upset, to be agitated, to be stirred. Making sense to you? Making sense to you? So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Can you believe that? You know, this this kind of heart. And right, there is a willing spirit here. It's a subdued one. Now the police said, he just wanted to Rest his head and the bosom of God. Am I a willing heart? You know, willing spirit, a man, a yielded one. Then he said, "Because that is restored, I will teach transgressors your ways." Am I? He he turned. Uh, am I? He 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 he's 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 more than delivered from his personal sins. Am I being forgiven? 
Now he's a teacher of God's way. Am I right? Teacher sinners God's way. Am I right? Making sense? Like Aaron was. He, yeah. Then I'll teach transgress your ways. Sinners will turn back to you. Because you're good. You're forgiving. And you're, you have a life and truth and goodness. Am I right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what he's saying to God. Save me from blind guilt of God. Kiss me. The God who saves me, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice is gone on a broken spirit. So he didn't turn to religious uh, performances, am I? To appease God. He turned to the inner court, amen, of God's way, am I? God's examination, his human conscience, am I making sense to you? Yeah, amen. The sacrifice of God, the broken spirit. The word broken spirit, it's not what we think brokenness is. Uh, we think brokenness is one basically what? Willing, crying, don't hold himself together anymore, am I? So what word broken spirit is meant? It's like a, uh, you have things damming up, am I? The dam need to be broken for the river to flow. Making sense to you? There are things that stumble us, hold us back, am I? Resistance, stubbornness, rebellion, all kinds of things, am I? We wilderness, making sense? Excuses, shame, fear, all kinds of things, am I? That we're not willing to come to God. And uh, or pride, especially pride, am I? So making sense to you? Or fear, whatever it is, that spirit is not broken. Amen? Hallelujah, because it's not basking itself in the presence, in the goodness of God. Am I? Have peace with God, a sweet fellowship with God. Making sense to you? You know, so that's a defined or we word or an unbelieving heart. Am I? Unbelieving spirit. And David said, No, I need to restore a sweet, a willing spirit, a teachable spirit, a, a right spirit within me. So I can, amen? But that spirit can, has to break off the shelf or the roughness of our own spirit and the human soul, am I? The human nature, in a sense. Making sense to you? So the conditions, our carnality. Yeah. The sacrifice is gone, and a broken spirit, a broken a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You know, there are sacrifices, kings versus Abel's. Whose sacrifice God despised? Kings, am I right? So then God tell you, sin is within your door. You know, so don't listen to him. There's a whole dynamic here, the same thing, you know. So talking about how we... Uh, as a human being, our heart, our soul, our mind is uh, is a deal with sin. And I'll be, be, be overpowered sin, invite sin into our life, or be washed away. Am I? Receive forgiveness and the repentance. Am I? Into our heart. Making sense to you? But uh, the ultimate is we have this right heart. Am I? A pure heart and a willing spirit. Am I? In your good pleasure. Make Zion prosper. Yeah. Because he know his own sin is not confined to his own personal ways. Am I right? A spiritual life. It mattered to the whole nation. It mattered to posterity. Am I right? Making sense he was a king, you know? So in your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the wall of Jerusalem. Am I? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Then there will be righteous sacrifices. Whole burnt offering delight you, then bowls will offered on your altar. So God wants first a clean heart, clean hands, a pure heart. They want the sacrifice. Am I? Else, am I? It's a, a religious show. Am I? Religious ceremony or rituals. Am I? Hallelujah. Anyway, turn to Psalm 32. That's an interesting one. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Because recently there was a sister 
saw the train of glory come down from heaven. But in it, there was this donkey holding a Bible. Can you believe that? And define to God's way, you know? So argue with the Lord. Can you believe that? The donkey is in every one of us. But interesting enough, speaking some, some uh, blinded or defined heart in our midst, you know? So, amen? Hallelujah. They're holding the Bible. Can you believe that? A donkey holding the Bible. What you need the Bible for? To make you more a donkey? <laughs> but, amen? Hallelujah. That's a perfect idea of religion. Am I? Religious spirit. Anyway. You pray for us before I move on to the next song. Lord, you are in discernment and wisdom, Lord, in all things we do, Lord, for all, all things we receive, Lord, we do against the religious and familiar spirit within our midst, in Jesus' name, mm. Lord, within the midst of your people, Lord, of your purpose, for it directly opposes that which you have planned for, for your sons, mm. Lord, for yourself. Mm. And Lord, you have given us this wisdom to know these things. Mm. Lord, even to see, Lord, and, and the power to pray against them. Mm. So Lord, we pray for continued discernment and exposing so that they may be properly, mm. Lord, dealt with, mm. Lord, by the power of, you, power of our minds, mm. Lord, Continue to pray that it would truly be exposed within our own midst, Lord, within your people. Mm. Lord, we may step into the life of all things. Mm. Lord, our hearts, our spirits are completely pure, Lord, and set apart and whole. Yes, Lord. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Psalm 32. Um, Psalm David. Mashkel. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones whisked away, through my groaning all day long, for day and night. Your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sad, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgive the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you, while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the sounds of deliverance. This is the answer from God, the same to me. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mill, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by beat the bridle, or they will not come to you. Many, back to the psalmist, many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice, what he said, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing. Oh, you who are upright in heart. Can you believe the, the, the transforming and the fundamental change happened to a repentant heart who is a singer forgiven? A goodness of God, am I right? So, joy restored. Is that amazing, right. thinking about it? Yeah. <laughs> the power of true forgiveness, huh? Yeah, amazing. Okay. Anyway, let's back to the reading. 
that the body and mind seem both to be included in this wonderful description, in which obstinate dumbness, constant torture, dread God, and not one soft and dreadful for pertinence to fill the dry and dusty heart, while the bones waxing old, whence the word might be rendered rotting, sleepless nights and pampers, the burning heat disease, are handed and the accompaniments of the soul agony. It's possible. A similar allusion to actual bodily illness are to be found in another psalm, probably referring to the same period, and pre presenting striking parallelisms for expression. That is Psalm six, am I right? Psalm six. Have mercy upon me, Jehovah, for I languished, feel away. Heal me, for my bones are frightened, are affrighted. My soul is also sore waxed. I am weary with my groaning every night. Make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. The similar phrase too in Psalm fifty-one: "The bones which thy hands broken," may have a similar application. Thus, a sick in body and soul, he dragged through a weary year, ashamed his guilty. Dalians, wretched in his guilty, Dalians. That's a strange word. I never heard that one before. A casual romantic or sexual relationship. Okay. Wretched in his self accusations, afraid of God, and skulking in the recesses of his palace from the sight of the people. A goodly price and the sold integrity for. The bread had been sweet for the moment, but the whole quickly his mouth is filled with the gravel. Gravel. David learned what we all learn, and the holier a man is, the more speedily and sharply does the lesson follow on the heel of the same. That every transgression is a blunder, that we never get the satisfaction which we expect, we expect from any sin, or if we do, we get something with it which is spoiled at all. The new serious drug is added to the exciting, intoxicating drink which temptations offers. Temptation offers, and though its flavor is at first disguised by the pleasanter taste of the sin, its bitterness is uh, persistent through, uh, though slow, and cling to the plate long after that it has faded utterly. Into this dreary life, Nathan's message came with merciful rebuke. The prompt severity David's judgment against the selfish sinner of the inimitable Ablog may be a subtle indication of the troubled conscience, which fancies some atonement for his own sin in stern repression of that of the others. For consciousness of evil may sometimes sting to harshness as well as soften to lenity, and sinful man is a sterner judge than the righteous God. The answer from Nathan is a perfect example of divine will for convincing of the sin. There is a first a plain charge pressed home on the individual conscience: "Thou art the man." Then follows not the reproach, nor for the deepening of the blackness of the deed, but the, a tender enumeration of God's great benefits, whereupon is built the solemn question: Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? To do evil in his sight, the contemplation of God's faithful love, and of the all-sufficient gifts which He bestows, makes every transgression irrational as well as ungrateful, and turns remorse, which consumes like the hard wind of the wilderness, into tearful repentance, which refreshes the soul. When God has seen loving the bestowing era. He commands the requires it is profitable to hold the image of the man's evil in all its ugliness, close up his eyes, and so the bold facts are repeated next in the fittest, strongest words. Nor can the message close until a rich law of retribution has been proclaimed, the slow operation of which will filter bitterness of bitterness. And shame 
through all his life. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Two words in the Hebrew makes the transition from a solemn misery to real, though shady peace. No lasting outpouring, no accumulation of self-reproach. He is too deeply moved for many words, which he knows God does not need. More would have been less. All is content in that one soul. In which the whole frostwork of these weary mosses break up and rolls away, swept before the strong flound, and as brief and simple as the confession is the response. And Nathan said unto David, "The Lord also has put away thy sin. How full and unconditional the blessing bestowed in these few words! How swift and sufficient the answer!" So the long entrenchment is ended. The simple and divine is the manner of pardon. In such a short compass may the turning point of a life lie. But while confession and forgiveness heal the bridge between God and David, pardon is not impunity, and the same silence which bestows the remission of sin announces the exaction of a penalty. The judgments threatened. A moment before, a moment so far removed now to David's consciousness that it would look as if an age in the past, a knot withdrawn, and another is ended. The death of Belshazzar's infant. God allows His servants too well to suffer sin upon them, and the fitness of forgiveness and the habitless consciousness of it may as consist with the loving of infliction and the submissive bearing of pains, which. Are no longer the strokes of a avenging judge, but the chastisements of a gracious father. The fifty-first psalm must, we think, be conceded as following, and soon, soon after Nathan's mission, there may be echoes the prophet's stern question: "Wherefore has I despised the command of the Lord to do evil in His sight?" And the confession: "I have sinned against the Lord." In the words against thee, thee only, had I sinned, done evil in thine sight. That is the worst for. Though Pamper's expressions are not so peculiar to as to the allusion certain, but as to make the allusion certain, but and all events, the penitents and per the psalm can scarcely be supposed to have preceded the date of the historical narrative, which clearly implies. That the rebuke of the seer was the first thing that broke up the dumb misery of unrepentant sin. Although the psalm is one long cry for pardon and restoration, one can discern an order and progress in its plantation. The order not of an artificial reproduction of the past mode of mind, but the instinctive order in which the emotion of full contrite desire will ever pour itself forth. In the psalm, all begins, and all begins, in fact, with the grunting, the cry for favor on thy loving kindness, the multitude of thy tender mercies, the one plea that wills with God, whose love is its own motive and its own measure, whose past acts are the standard for all his future, whose compassions, in their innumerable numbers, are more than the sum of our transgressions, though these. More than the hairs on our head, beginning with God's mercy, the penitent soul can learn to look next upon its own sin in all its aspects of evil. The depth and intensity, the soundless loathing of itself, is wonderfully expressed in the word for his crime. He speaks of his transgressions and his sin. Look at in one way. Look at it in one way. He sees the separate acts of which he had been guilty: lust, fraud, treachery, murder. Look at in another. He sees them all knotted together in one inextricable tangle of forked, hissing tongues, like the serpent the locks and coil and twists round a gorgon head. No sin dwells alone. The separate acts have a Common root, and the whole is a man together, like the green growth on the stagnant pond, so that by whatever filament 
it is grasped, the whole mass is drawn towards you. In a profound insight into the essence of character sin lies in the accumulated sinfulness. Its transgression, or as the word might be rendered, rebellion, not the mere breach of impersonal law, but merely, not merely an infraction of the constitution of our nature, but the rising of a subject will against the true king, disobedience to a person as well as contravention, contravention of the a standard, its iniquity, perversion or distortion, a word. Which expresses the same metaphor as it is found in many languages, namely crookedness and descriptive deeds which depart from the perfect line of right. It's sin that is missing one's aim, in which a profound word is contained the truth that all sin is a blunder, shooting wide of its true goal. If regard had to be, had to be. If regard be hand to the end of our being, and not less wide, its regard be hand to our happiness. Well, that's difficult to state structure there. So, <laughs> have you read、uh, grammar like that? That's a strange statement there. Let's do it again.、Yeah. So we study something. It's a sin that is missing one's aim, in which a profound word is contained. The truth that all sin is a blunder, shooting wound of the true goal. If regard be hand to the end of our being, and not less wild is re- if regard be hand to our happiness. It ever misses the mark, and s- ah, edif, edif, I forgot this word. What is it called? Edif, ep, 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 epitaph. Epita, yeah, a phrase or statement which is not a memory of a person and died. Epita, epita, epita. Okay, I should know better. Epita might be written over every sinner who seeks pleasure and the prize of righteousness. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, yeah, okay. No less pregnant with meaning is the psalmist's emphatic acknowledgement against thee, thee only. Had I sinned, is not content with looking upon his evil in himself, nor in relation only to the people, and suffered by it. He thinks of it in relation to God. Yet he being guilty for crimes against the bishop and the Uriah, and even the rough soldier, whom he made his tool, as well as against his whole subjects. But dark and these were, they assumed, the true character only when. They were discerned as done against God. Sin, in the full sense, implied God as a correlative. We transgress against each other, but we sin against Him. Nor does the psalmist stop here. He acknowledges the tangle, the multiplicity, and dreadful unity of his evil. In the same scene, most character has learned to bring his deed into connection with God. What remains still to be confessed, he laments, and then not as extenuation, so it may be explanation, but as aggravation, the sinful nature in which he had been born. The deeds and come from a source, a bitter fountain has welled out this blackness. He himself is evil, therefore he had done evil. The sin is he. He will not contest his full responsibility, and his full characteristic declares the inward fullness from which it is flowed, and then the fullness is himself. Does he therefore think that he is less to blame? By no means. His acknowledgment, his acknowledgment of a evil nature, is the very deepest of his confessions, at least not to a palliation of the guilt. But to a cry to him, who alone can heal the inward wound, and as he can purge with the transgressions, can likewise staunch their source and give him to feel within that is healed from that plague. The same intensity of feeling impressed by the use of so many words for sin is revealed also in the reiterated synonyms for pardon, 
The prayer comes from his lips over and over again, not because he thinks that he shall be heard for his much speaking, but because of the earnestness of his longing. Such repetitions are signs of the persistence of faith, while others, though they last like the prayers for miles of priests from morning till the time the evening sacrifice, indicate only the supplant's doubt. David prayed that his sins may be blotted out. In which petition they are conceived as record against him in the archives of the heavens, that he may be washed from them. In which they are conceived as full stains upon himself, needing for the removal, hard rubbing, beating, for such is, according to the some commentators, the force of the word, and that he may be cleansed. The technical word for the priestly cleansing the leper and declaring him clear of the tent. He also, with a similar recurrence to the mosaic symbols, prays that he may be purged with a high soap. There is a pathetic appropriateness in the temptation for not only lepers but those who have become defiled by contact with a dead body were thus purified. And on whom did the tent of corruption close hands on the murderer Uriah? The prayer too is even more remarkable in its original. Which employs a verb form from the verb for sin, and if in our language that a word a word in use, it might be translated, "Thou shalt unsin me." Wow, that's powerful, huh? Think about that word, unsin me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the midst of this, a base confession, a cry for pardon, there comes with wonderful forces of beauty, the bold. Prayer for restoration to joy and gladness, an indication surely for more than ordinary confidence in the full mercy God, which would efface all the consequences of his sin. A falling upon them, a petitions for sanctifying, reiterated and many sided like those that have preceded. Three pairs of clauses contain this in each, of which the second number of the clause asks for. The infusion to his spirit some grace from God that he may possess a steadfast spirit, the high and holy spirit, a willing spirit. Its members not an accident that is a central petition of the three is one which most clearly expresses the thought, which all imply that the human spirit can only be renewed and hallowed by the entrance into it of the divine. We are not to commit the theological. Anachronism, anachronism, which have been applied with such evil effect to the whole Old Testament, I suppose that David meant by that the central clause in the prayer for renewal, or that we mean by it. But he meant at least that his spiritual nature could be made to love righteousness and hate iniquity by none other power than God's breathing on it. If we may venture to regard this as the heart of the series, the other two on either side of it may be considered as its consequences. It will then be a right spirit, or, as the word means, a steadfast spirit, strong to resist, nor swept away by surges of passion, nor shaken by terrors of remorse, but calm, tenacious, and resolute, pressing on in the path of holiness. And immovable with the immobility of those who are rooted in God and in goodness, it will be a free, a willing spirit, ready for all joyful services of thankfulness, and so penetrated with the love of God that it will delight to do His will, and carry the law characters in the spontaneous impulses of His renewed nature, nor without a profound meaning that the summons seem to recur in this hour. I'm sorry. In his hour of penitence, to the tragic fate of his predecessor in the monarchy, to whom, as to himself, the tomb of the soul, am I, have been given the same anointing, the same gift of the Spirit of God. Remembering how the holy chrism had faded from the riven locks of his soul long before his bloody head had been sent round the Philistine cities to. Glad the revenge, and knowing that if God were strict to 
mark iniquity, the gift which had been withdrawn from Saul would be, would not be continued to himself. He prays not as anointed monarch and lay, but as a sinful man. Take no thy holy spirit from me. As before he had ventured to ask for the joy of forgiveness, so now he pleads once more, once more for the joy of thy salvation, which comes from cleansing. Wow, the joy of forgiveness, the joy of salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. Which come from cleansing, from conscience of fellowship, which he had so long deeply felt, which for so many months had been hidden from him by the midst of his own sin. The psalmist's natural billions, billions, the gladness which was his as inseparable part of his religion and had wrung from his heart in many an hour of peril, the bold with his desires grounded on the clear basis of faith in God's perfect forgiveness are all expressed in such a prayer from such lips and at such a time that may well be pardoned, uh, I'm sorry, well be pondered and imitated by us. Is that an amazing writing here? Amazing. Bless the Lord. Mm. The lowly prayer which we have been tracing rises there. It's close to a wall of renewed praise. It's very beautiful to know the whole the pulled nature as well as the consciousness of the divine function united in the resolve that crowned the psalm. To David, no tribute that it could bring to God seems so little unworthy. None to himself through joyful, through joyous as the music of his harp and the melody of his songs. Nor was any part of his kingly office so lofty his exclamation as his calling to proclaim in glowing words the name of the Lord, that man might learn to love his early song in Zao and close with the like of all it has been well fulfilled for many years. But these last doleful monsters had silenced all his praise. Now, as hope began to shine upon him once more, the force which had stilled the stream of his devotion is melting, and as he remembered his glad sounds of old, and his miserable dumbness, his final prayers, O oh, Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thine praise. The same consciousness sin, which we have found in the previous words, discerning the true significance of ceremonial purification, leads also to the recognition as the insufficiency of outward sacrifices sought, which is not, as some modern critic may fain make it, the product of the latest age of Judaism, but appears occasionally through the whole of the history and indicates not the date, but the spiritual elevation of his antra. David set us on the word summit of his psalm to sparkle there like some stone of pride. The rich jewel which he had brought up from the abyss of degradation is that the truth which had shone out from its setting here over three millenniums, the sacrifice is gone, and a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, Lord, thou wilt not despise. The word which will follow, containing a prayer for the building up thine and the prediction of the continuous offering of sacrifice, present some difficulty. We do not necessarily suppose that Jerusalem is in ruins, for thou who build down the walls, be no less appropriate a plantation for the fortification who are unfinished, as we know they were in David's time, than if their hand be broken down. Nor do the word contradict the will of sacrifices given for the use of the symbol and the conviction of its insufficiency coexisted. In fact, in every devout life, and it may well be expressed side by side, but the transition from so intensely personal emotion to intercession for Zion seems almost too sudden, even for the nature as wide and warm as David. If the closing verses are his, we may indeed see in them the king reawakening to a sense of his responsibilities, which he had so long neglected. First, in the selfishness of his heart, and then in the morbid self-absorption of his remorse, and the lesson may be a precious one that is the first thought the pardoned man should be for others. But there is much to be said. On the other hand, in fear of the conjunction 
I'm sorry, the conjuncture that these verses on a later edition, probably after the return from captivity, when the walls of Zion were in ruins and the altar of the temple had been long cold. I don't think so, am I? So, to be silly, suppose that the last words ended later. You know, not David's own writing. That's not true, am I? So, I think David was a king. He suddenly recognized his mistake has a huge impact and ramification for the whole kingdom, am I? For whole God's people, and his deeds, his heart, his ways, how in the balance with God's covenant and the, the fear, the blessing, the concerning. God's chosen people, am I right? So he see his stupidity more than in his own yeah. personal light, am I right? Of a righteous man being a chosen good man, am I right? making sense to you? But the seeing in the full spectrum of God's work yeah. towards his people and his responsibility thereof, his calling thereof. You know, Paul had the same feeling, amen, besides his Christ. He said, I will not be unfaithful to the high call, am I right? The call from above, basically. Hallelujah. And this you pray, so yeah, we are called. Noah, we're not reading here for entertainment or for mere revelation. Am I for study? Amen. But for the real heart, and real formation of、uh, the sonship, the the God, His heart, His wisdom, His purpose in our life. So yes, go ahead. Lord, I pray that you would truly bring understanding into our hearts, Lord, and our spirit, Lord, a a deeper capacity, Lord, for the Lord the 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 very energy, Lord, and and desire you have for your purpose to be fulfilled. Lord, within our lives, Lord, the lives of your people,、mm. Lord, truly, it, it is such a wide, Lord, and deep capacity,、mm. Lord, almost impossible, Lord, for us to fathom the the greatness of your purpose,、mm. Lord, even the very purpose of your purpose,、mm. Lord, it, there are things that truly no man has has fully grasped. Lord, but we, nonetheless, desire to grasp it,、mm. or our spirits desire to know and understand it.、Mm. Lord, as we desire to know, understand Your heart,、mm. Lord, and fulfill the desires of Your heart.、Mm. So, Lord, I, I bless this, this,、uh, this motivation within us, Lord,、mm. within Your people,、mm. Lord, that it would grow and burn within us,、mm. Lord, even more so that it would be fulfilled. Within、mm. us and within you and your purpose. Yes, Lord, help us. Bless this in name.、Mm. Amen. Thank you for the prayer.、Mm. Let's move on. If so,、hmm? where we were? Okay, let me reverse a little bit. There is much to be said. On the other hand, in favor of the conjuncture that this verse is. And the later addition, probably after the return from captivity, when the walls of Zion were in ruins and the altar, of the temple, had been long cold. If so, then our psalm that it came from David's full heart would be all of a price, a peace, one great gush of penitence and faith, beginning with "Have mercy upon me, O God," ending with an assurance of acceptance that is so remaining for all ages. The child. The thorny, the young, blessed path that leads from death unto life. In that aspect, what it does not contain is as noteworthy as what it does. Not one word asks for exemption from such penalties of his great fall as can be inflicted by a loving father on the soul that lives in his love. He cries for pardon, but he gives his back to the smiter. Whom God may please to send. The other psalm, of、uh, the pertinent that is thirty-two, have been already referred to in connection with autobiographical materials which it contains. Is evidently of a later period than the fifty-first. There is no struggle in it. 
the prayer had been heard, and this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the law to show forth God's praise. The good he has said, he and said, Then will I teach transgressors the way. Here he said, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way where thou shalt go. There he begins with the plenty cry for mercy. Here was a burst of praise celebrating the happiness of the pardon penitent. There we heard the sobs of a man in the word agony of abasement. Here we have the story of the blessed ensue. There we had multiplied synonyms for sin and for the forgiveness which has which was desired. Here it is a many sided preciousness of forgiveness possessed which runs over in various and equivalent phrases. There the highest point to which he could climb was the assurance that a bruised heart was accepted and the bones of broken mind still rejoice. Here the very first word is of blessedness, and the close summons a righteous to exuberant joy. The one is the sum of a willing, the other the willing, and the other, to use his own words, a song of a deliverance. What a glad conscience is that he himself is a happy man, whom he describes ring in the maladies, variations of the one thought of forgiveness in the opening words. How grateful he draws on the treasures and recent experience while he sets forth as being the taking away of sin, as if it were the removal of a solid something or the lifting of a burden off his back, yet as the covering of sin, as if it were the wrapping of his ugliness in thick folds that hide it forever, even from the all seeing eye, and as the non reckless sin, as if it were the discharge for debt. What vivid memory of past misery in the awful portrait of his impertinent self already referred to, on which the mind dwells in silence while as the musical accompaniments as directed by the Salah touches some plenty minor and greeting discord. Is that beautiful? He used music. Huh? Honorable and eloquent the brief words echoes a historical narrative that tell the fall and the sweet forgiveness then the follows simple confession and the whole effectively the music again comes in prolonging the song rejoicing the pardon how sure is he how sure he is that his experiences of a priceless value, uh, value to the world for all time when he sees his uh, absolution a uh, motive that will draw all the godly nearer to the helper in heaven Oh, for oh, his heart is of praise, that he can but go back again to his own story. I rejoice in God, his hiding place, whose past wondrous love assured him that in the future son's deliverance will ring him round, and all his path be encompassed with a music of praise. So ends the more personal part of the psalm. A more didactic portion follows the generalization of that, but Possibly the voice which now speaks in a higher than David's, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. Scarcely sounds like words meant to be understood as spoken by him. They are the promise from heaven of a gentle teaching to the pardoned man, which will instruct by no severity, but by patient schooling which will not direct by no harsh authority, but by that loving glance that is enough for those who love. It is all too subtle and delicate to the proceed, to be perceived by any other. Such a gracious direction is not for the summoners alone, but it needs a spirit in harmony with God to understand it. For others there can be nothing higher than mere force, the disciplined sorrow, the bridal, the bridal, or bridal, the bridal. It's bridal, yeah. Okay, the bridal, in the hard mouth, the weep, or the stiff back. The choice for all men is through penitence and the forgiveness to rise to the true position man, capable of receiving 
and obeying a spiritual guidance which appeals to the heart and gently subdues the will, and by stubborn impenitence, impenitence to fold the l o l o f r u i t s that can only be held in by the halter and driven by a lash. And because this is the alternative, therefore many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but his e n t r a t i s in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. And then the psalm ends with a great cry of gladness, three times reiterated, like the voice of a herald on some festival day of a nation. Rejoice in Jehovah, and leap for joy, O righteous! And glad shout, O ye upright in heart! Such is the end of the psalms of the penitent. Penitent. I have a hard time with that word. Penitent. With that, bless you, Lord. Bless you. Bless you. Amen.